So we're going to be talking today about progressive diffusion. And the reason we're going to be talking about it is because the two papers that Google published recently, 5th of October, 6th of October, so like a week ago now, both mention it. And one of them is the bonkers crazy image and video paper where they do bonkers crazy things like this. And the other one's a bit more dry, but both of them talk about how they use this thing called progressive distillation to make their diffusion models like better. Progressive distillation is an improvement that Google came out with for latent diffusion models, which of course includes things like Dali and stable diffusion, where it cuts down the number of iterations you need to perform on a noisy image to go from like noise to a nice image by you know, a huge margin, something like 200,000% in some cases, which you know, I'm sure that's like an edge case. But the point is, this will likely make inference way, way faster. The actual mechanics of progressive distillation were laid out in another paper which uh, was published in June of this year, so basically ancient history by this point. That's the paper we're going to be focusing on today, and I guess just keep in mind that it's one of the things behind image and video and behind the reason they're able to get such crazy outputs. Okay, so we're going to go through this whole huge diagram together, and by the end of it you'll know exactly what progressive distillation is, and you'll be a smarty pants genius fancy boy. So it's gonna be good. Okay, so we're gonna start with a quick recap of how latent diffusion models work. So latent diffusion models, that's like DALI, stable diffusion, Imogen, it's like all those kind of guys. And to understand latent diffusion models, I find it's easiest to start with what came before them, which was GANs. And so the idea of a GAN was, it was, a, it was called a generative adversarial network and it was really complicated and hard to train. Basically, it was a, a machine learning model that you would give it an image and it would spit out another image. To begin with, you would give the GAN noise and it would spit out noise. And then through a complicated training process where you kept penalizing the GAN for making images that looked like this and rewarding it for making images that looked like, you know, like this, um, you slowly, slowly, slowly train the GAN to create nice looking images. Now, GANs were actually quite effective. There were like a few really nice projects that had very good results with GANs, but basically they were really, really hard to train because in a single step, a GAN had to go from complete noise to something that looked very nice. That was basically something that was just really, really hard to do. It was really hard for the GAN to make that huge step. So the idea behind latent diffusion models is that you train it Rather than making one huge step, you train the model to make many small steps. So uh, what you do is you take your original image, the one that you want the model to create, and then you add Gaussian noise to it step by step until basically all you have is noise, and that's all. And then rather than doing the GAN strategy where you try to get the image to go from noise to a nice image, all you try to do is get the diffusion model to go from noise to a tiny bit of less noise. So you pass it in the noise, you expect it to produce this very slightly less noisy image, and then you penalize whatever it, it creates until it's accurate. And you also pass in the slightly less noisy image and expect it to create the even less noisy image. And you also pass in the even less noisy one and expect the even, even less noisy one, and then the almost denoised one, and you expect the actual noise one. Um, and you sort of train it on these steps like this. So you pass in a, a slightly noisy image, and you always expect it to give you a slightly less noisy image, and you penalize it whenever it doesn't. And this actually turns out to be pretty easy to train. It's not so hard to get models that can do sort of these small steps going from this noisy image to a bit of a less noisy image. That's, that's doable. And then finally, when it comes to inference time and you want to go from your nothing to an image, you get the model to create a slightly less noisy image, then you pass that same slightly less noisy image back to the model again, and then you perform a second step, and then you get an even less noisy image, and so on and so forth until you end up with an actual nice image. And so in this way, the diffusion model can kind of do what the GAN does, right? The GAN goes from nothing to a nice image. The diffusion model also goes from nothing to a nice image, but there are all these intermediate steps. 
Okay, so that's Diffusion Worlds. Now, the paper, which was published on the 7th of June, pointed out that this process is really costly and would be really nice if we could find a way of getting around it. Uh, the actual quote from the paper is, so far, most models in the literature have needed hundreds or thousands of iterative steps to produce their highest quality samples. This is the solution that people in the paper have come up with. It's called progressive distillation, which uses something called knowledge distillation, which is a machine learning thing that's done sometimes where first you train a teacher model to be good, and then using the teacher model, you can then train a student model even faster and more efficiently than the teacher model. And the student model is like now smarter than the teacher. The idea is you take this accurate but slow diffusion model that you've created and you make it a teacher and you use it to teach a faster model as a, as a student. You shouldn't need it, use the faster model. Okay, so just to recap, the way you create the training data for the distillation process is you have a nice image and you keep applying Gaussian noise until it basically looks like noise. Okay, so the guys in the paper, what they did is they took the teacher model that had been trained and they made an exact clone of it. So the student is just the same model, same weight, same parameters, um, you know, same structure, everything. The student model is an exact clone. Okay, and then we get the teacher to run two iterations. So you give it the complete noise and you expect it to give you an output, which is a bit less noisy. And then you pass that back in again. And so you end up with an output that's like two steps removed from the most noisy output, right? We've taken these two steps, we've gone from here to here. We then give the student the completely noisy input and we expect it to take two steps of denoising at once and match the teacher's output. So the teacher, the teacher is a model that can go from here to here and then here to here and then here to here to here and then here to here to get a nice image. We want the student to be able to go from here to here and then from here to here. That's what we want the student to be able to do. And what we do is we get the teacher to make, to make its two steps and then train the student to match the teacher's output in one single step. And empirically it turns out that this works, you know, this can be done. You keep training the student to match the teacher's output, but twice as fast, and you end up with a student that can take two steps for every iteration uh, compared to the teacher's one step. And then, because it's called progressive distillation, you just do the same thing again. You make the student model, you turn it into the teacher model now, and then you create a new student from that student, and then you just repeat the process. So, and first you had this model one, the teacher, that went from noise to A, A to B, B to C, and then you got an image. The model two goes from noise straight to B, and then B straight to the image, and then you train model three on model two, which can go straight from noise to an image. And using this progressive distillation process, they started with a model that took 8,192 steps, and they ended up with a model that took only four steps, which is a 204,800% speed increase, which is a lot of a speed increase. That's a big speed increase. Okay, great. But now there's this like pretty important question. How the hell does this work? Why does this work? If it's possible for the student to take these two steps at once, why do we even need the teacher at all? We already know the output we're gunning for, right? We want a model that can go from here to here. Well, why not just train the student to do that? Rather than training it to go from step five to step four, we can just train it to go from step five to step three, right? Like, what's stopping us doing that? Why do you even need the teacher's output at all? Why is the teacher's output important? if you can make these jumps of two at a time. What's going on there? Yeah, the fact of the matter is you can't make two jumps at a time. They tried a whole bunch of different jump lengths and they chose the length that works the best. And it's the length that they trained the teacher model on, i.e. one at a time. If a longer jump would be better, then they would have just trained it on a longer jump. So actually, it turns out there's something that about the teacher's outputs that make it easier for a student to learn than just the regular noising that we have. So why is it that the teacher's outputs are easier to train on? The answer is the teacher's outputs are not random. When we apply this Gaussian noise, we apply it randomly to each image. I guess to make it a bit more visible, let's say rather than adding like these tiny speckles that you can't really track, instead we're adding these big gray blocks. 
and we're adding another random big gray block to the image instead. So actually what is happening is this, but let's just visualize it as gray blocks instead. And each time we add more noise to the image and we do that by just adding another gray block. So these are the possible outcomes. And of course, how do we choose what gray block to add? We just randomly pick an area and we add a gray block to it. And so in the end, we, we, we get this, uh, we get the clean image, we add more and more noise to it, and then eventually you end up with an image that's like unrecognizable. And then the task of the model is to go from the, the noised image to the less noisy image, right? And inherently, because of the randomness, that's actually not such an easy thing to do. You, you have this randomized image, and we're trying to make it less random. And there are actually a bunch of equally plausible, less random images that the model could generate. Like each of these here is plausible, but only one of them is actually correct, right? The, the, the original one was this one. If the model generates any of the other plausible examples, it's just going to get penalized. It has to generate the right one to be correct. And it has no way of knowing which one to generate. Does that kind of track? Because we, we, we chose, we randomly chose how to add noise. The model has to learn how to do the inverse, to take away noise. But you can't learn a random process. Each of these sort of noise inversion strategies is plausible, but only one is correct. And because of that, because the model has no way of working out how to get the correct answer exactly, in general, empirically, they found that models tended to learn to sort of hedge their bets. Because a bunch of denoised images were equally plausible, what they would end up doing is just sort of making a fuzzy denoising operation that would kind of work for all possible images a little bit. And it still worked fine, right? We, we can see the results, stable diffusion, DALI image, and they're all really good results. But because of this uncertainty where the model wasn't sure which of these random denoising strategies to apply, and it was getting penalized for reasons that it just couldn't comprehend, it slowed down training and it meant the steps had to be like small. I found that really hard to get my head around, but sort of in a nutshell, because the noising strategy is random, and what we're teaching the model to do is invert the noising strategy. It's always going to be a little bit hard for the model to learn to do that because it's impossible to learn a random process. That's about as well as I can sum it up. Okay, what does this have to do with progressive distillation? Well, the nice thing about the teacher model is that its outputs, given a particular input, are deterministic. The teacher has a determined learnable strategy that will always go from a particular noisy image to an exactly particular less noisy image. Which means that every time you give an image to the student, there is only one correct answer, and that correct answer is learnable. We know it's learnable because the teacher learned it. So in the original training loop, the student had to guess between multiple plausible answers whenever it made a suggestion, and it would always get penalized if it got it wrong, which would be a lot of the time. In this case, there is only one correct answer. It's the output the teacher gives. And this is completely determined, not random at all. So the student can learn. And because of that, training is faster. And we have this nice quote from the paper, by making sharper predictions, the student model can make faster progress during the sampling. Final little observation in this paper. So remember with progressive distillation, we start off with the teacher, and then we train a slightly faster student, and then from that we train an even faster student. Well, the question is, why can't we go and train Model 3 on Model 1? Why do we need Model 2 at all? They don't actually go into this in the paper, but here's my theory. Because the teacher learned from this random process, it was taught to make kind of slightly random output guesses and sort of fuzzy guesses, right? And this fuzziness is actually makes it a little bit hard for the student to work out what's going on. You end up, after teaching, with a student that makes sharper guesses than the teacher did because it was trained on the teacher's deterministic outputs rather than the random outputs. So presumably because the student makes even sharper predictions than the teacher, it's possible to train an even sharper student on that student. So that's 
that's my theory as to why we have to have to go from model one to two to three. Although again, I haven't, I didn't actually read that explicitly in the paper. Okay, and that's it. Um, hopefully now all of us understand progressive distillation, and we can all go and and use it in our own work or something. I don't know. Okay, so what's the upshot from all of this? Well, basically, we can expect models to become a lot faster. At the moment, you're running stable diffusion locally. It's taking like 20 iterations to you know, get your avocado chair. Probably, using this technology, we can expect that they'll be able to cut that down to like four or three iterations. Okay, hopefully that was like helpful. If you have any questions, and especially if I've gotten something wrong, definitely get in touch. I read all the YouTube comments, so that's one way. There's also a Discord. Um, that you can join and berate me in there. Uh, and also, generally, the videos that, are, that this channel has been making have started on the Discord where someone said, hey, this is really cool, and that's how the videos come about. So if you have any suggestions and stuff, Discord's a really good way to 